Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Now, from my former life in IT, I know that many big venues and shopping malls, etc., are exploring Wi-Fi tracking now, and because the insight surrounding the location of consumers is incredibly valuable, because I think businesses are only just beginning to understand the value of the dwell time of their consumers and their location when they're on their premises. But the data and insights gained from this technology is often encrypted and reveals no personal information at all. So it's not as creepy as you might initially think. Now, I recently came across a company called Ground Truth that blueprints a proprietary platform that essentially automates geo boundaries around key places or points of interest. And it's through this first party data that Ground Truth can then interpret real world behaviours. And most importantly, of course, for business owners, customer insights. Grand Truth offers solutions that are designed to drive in-store traffic and solutions. And this will then allow marketers to leverage their first-party location data to learn more about their business, actively engage with their consumers more, all through precise location and audience targeting. And of course, measure sales impact all in real time. Now, in a world where all we ever hear about is online shopping and how, and how high street stores and shopping malls are in danger of closing down, I wanted to investigate how technology is actually transforming experiences in the real world, not just online. So buckle up, hold on tight, because I want to beam your ears all the way to Minneapolis in Minnesota so we can speak with Sarah from Ground Truth. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Sarah. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. So I work at a company called Ground Truth. Uh, we're a location-based technology company. Uh, we see about two out of three smartphone users every month in the U.S., um, around the same globally as well. But we use then use that location data to learn about consumers and reach them, ultimately helping our partners inform and make better marketing decisions. So who I am specifically at, at Ground Truth, um, I run our marketing insights. And you know, like I said, there's a lot of things we can do with this location data. What I do specifically is really synthesizing those location signals that we, come in, that we see coming in uh, to our platform and turning them into consumer insights. So location can say a lot about who somebody is as a consumer and also the broader macro trends. So trying to really analyze all of that to draw out the stories and basically give not only our, our partners, but you know everybody who wants to learn about it a, a better idea of, of what's going on in, in the market at the moment. The thing is, with those insights that you mentioned there, what I love is that Grand Truth seems to offer solutions that are designed to actually then take those uh, insights to drive in-store traffic and sales. And as a result of that, marketers are going to be leveraging first-party location data to learn more about their business and actively engage with consumers through precise location and audience targeting and ultimately measure their sales impact in the moment. But are there any examples or use cases of this that will enable anyone listening to actually visualize what problems you're solving and also typically what makes Ground Truth unique from all those other solutions out there? Because it does seem to be all the rage at the moment, doesn't it, this uh, location tracking, particularly through Wi-Fi? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, um, I, I think one of the first things that makes us unique is that we've been doing this for a while. So Ground Truth, uh, formerly known as XAD until um, earlier this year, actually, we just rebranded and changed our name. But we've been doing this since 2009. Um, I've personally been at the company for almost five years. And just being in the location game that long has allowed us to, to really develop a sense of um, accuracy, precision, and scale uh, that really, I, you know, I personally think sets us <laughs> apart in the game. But uh, from my personal point of view, it's been really amazing to see how location has evolved. I think uh, a lot of people who are just now getting introduced to location really think of it as proximity. They think of it as the immediate location around a store when really, if you think about how we're using it now to understand consumers, there's so much, so much more to location uh, in and of itself. Um, and as for our, our technology specifically and, and sort of what sets that apart, I, I think our secret sauce really, it comes down to, to two pieces. Um, and it's, it's really about accuracy. So accurate location signals and accurate place measurement. Uh, for the, the first part, the location signals, uh, we, we use what we call location verification. So how we differ is really that if we see a location signal that we don't deem as accurate, 
we don't use it. Uh, we would never use that. Uh, we have a proprietary patented algorithm that, again, we've been developing since 2009 to really scrub down these location signals that we see coming in to make sure when we're saying somebody is at a specific lat long, they really are at that lat long. The second piece, the accurate place location mapping, uh, we have a very precise mapping technology that we use to define a physical place. So really anything you can see on a map, we can blueprint. Blueprint is, is what we call it. Um, currently, we have about 3.5 million businesses and points of interest blue-pointed. So uh, that's everything, obviously, from a store with a physical location to a point of interest like a tourist attraction or a sports stadium. And then from there, one other differentiating point is the level of precision. So, you know, getting it accurate is is a big part of it, and then precise as well. So we have different layers. Um, you can actually tell with our technology, with our blueprints technology, whether somebody is in a store, in the parking lot, or just in the general retail block. So you can uh, imagine the level of insights this can give. For example, uh, a fast food restaurant, we can see whether somebody is actually in the restaurant or driving through the drive-through, um, and that gives us just insights about what people are doing throughout their day and allows marketers to better reach and speak to these consumers as well. So, do you think location tech is becoming a critical aspect of marketing intelligence now? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the things we always say here is uh, location is the greatest source of intent. Yeah. And what I mean by that, if you think about, for example, somebody buying a car, you know, they might go online, be looking, you can see, learn some stuff about their consumer journey as they're actually online looking for a car. But when they're actually on a lot, they're a lot closer to that, that purchase. So, um, you know, you don't know where somebody is in their journey when they're doing the general research, but location is telling you exactly where they are in the moment and then where they are in their purchase journey from that. Uh, one of the things I like to say is, you know, people can lie, location can't. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if you ask somebody about what they're doing, I guess lying is probably a little bit too harsh. But, you know, people are, are, aren't always clear on exactly what their intentions are, what their thoughts are. So, you know, you might ask somebody and they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, I don't, I, I, I eat really healthy. I don't think I've been to a fast food restaurant in the past 30 days. Well, we can actually tell from location data whether they have or have not been to that, that fast food restaurant. So it gives a much clearer picture of who they are than anything, whether, whether it's self-reported or social or even their search behavior can, can give you of that consumer. I wonder how many spouses that are listening that are tracking their significant <laughs> others on Find My Friends on iPhones and things are going to use that line you quoted there. <laughs> People may lie, but your location can't. <laughs> I think I think it's really just about um, the, the other example I like to give if you're thinking about sort of search or social is, uh, you know, I may be on Facebook and like really luxury goods. I might follow Louis Vuitton because I just think it's beautiful to look at. Uh, but in reality, you are probably going to find me in a discount retailer shop because uh, that's more what my, my actual behavior in the real world is. So you can imagine from a marketer's point of view that view of, you know, aspirational is great to understand sort of what what people, how people perceive themselves and what their likes are and interests are. But when it comes down to actual purchase behavior and intent, location is going to give you the, the real picture, the true story. So how does Ground Truth go about getting that data? Is it through things like opt-ins on Wi-Fi? Yeah, so um, it's it's through, through mobile devices yeah. and it's uh, opting in through either... Um, uh, partnerships, uh, apps that we have partnerships with. So we actually uh, acquired Weatherbug about a year ago, which is a, a weather app, a popular weather app in uh, the U.S. and now expanding globally. So we're able to see location data from that or, or partnerships with, with other apps in our platform as well. Do you notice things like trends with weather? Does that affect uh, when people go out and purchasing habits and things? Yeah, we've done actually um, a lot of research on this right right after we um, acquired Weatherbug. That was one of the big things was like, let's find out how, how weather impacts it. And I would say at a broad level, when it's nice out, people go out more. When it's not nice out, people stay in more. Um, it, it definitely depends by, by industry what people are willing to venture out for. And it, it's really, I, I think there's a lot of variables that go into it in terms of just seasonality, day of week, and even region. So you can imagine like bad weather in um, where, where I live up in the Midwest, in the US, it's, uh, we're a little bit more used to the sort of cold weather, bad weather, so it affects their behavior less 
than somewhere like um, California. When it rains in California, people just don't want to go out at all. <laughs> <laughs> so another question I was going to ask, I mean, why exactly, because uh, I've had this recently, does Ground Truth predict that Amazon's next HQ will be in Charlotte, North Carolina? I mean, what factors did the team take into account to reach that prediction? Yeah, so this is, this is a really fun analysis uh, that my team did. Obviously, everybody was talking about uh, where Amazon's, and is still actually talking about where Amazon's next headquarters is going to be. I think um, there's some crazy stunts all these cities were pulling, just trying to basically woo Amazon to, to come there. And again, you know, back to the thing I said earlier with people can lie, location can't. We were like, what can we actually dig out from location behavior that can add to this story? There's a lot of uh, there were a lot of requirements that Amazon set out that you know people were making analysis based on that. And we were like, let's look at location, just see if we can we can dig a little bit deeper. So what we did, we started with some of what we knew just from the initial analysis that had been done on the the early requirements. We started with with seven of the lead contender cities, and we wanted to compare some of uh, some of the location behaviors there. So the three main things we looked at were public transportation, uh, location-based audiences, uh, and then traffic to grocery stores and mass merchandisers. For public transportation, obviously this is a huge part of why people um, would choose a city, because you need a good infrastructure in place. Uh, we wanted to look at the different airports for the cities. And uh, one of the things that popped out about Charlotte is that they're about 5% busier on weekdays. So what we deduce from this is that, okay, they have a very thriving business culture. We have a lot of, of uh, business travelers throughout the week. The second thing we looked at, location-based audiences. So I mentioned earlier in the conversation about locations evolved a lot beyond proximity. So one of the coolest things that I've seen evolved is the ability to the ability to uh, derive audiences from location behavior. So this is based on past behaviors. We can see the different types of places people go and then basically group them into audiences or characteristics. So the ones we looked at for Amazon were business travelers, grocery shoppers, and young professionals because these are all the, the main characteristics we thought would uh, appeal to, to Amazon in terms of where they'd wanna lay their headquarter. So what we saw is that according to the location-based audiences on our platform, Charlotte had a 30% higher population of millennials, young professionals, and college university attendees compared to the average cities that we, uh, that we analyzed. And then the final one that we looked at was uh, traffic to grocery stores and mass merchandisers. So mass merchandisers, the, the big box retailers, obviously are a, a couple of things. Um, one, this is, it, it just points to a lot of people going out and doing frequent shopping, but it also is a competitive edge for Amazon to be headquartered where a lot of people are going to these stores, possibly influencing them to switch to online shopping versus actually going into the stores uh, with Amazon, engaging with Amazon a little bit more. Um, the grocery store piece is interesting because I think as most people uh, are aware, Amazon recently, earlier this year, acquired Whole Foods, uh, which is a big grocery store. And so going somewhere where there's a lot of uh, grocery store traffic is really, from that acquisition's point of view, a, a huge advantage for Amazon. So when it came down to the mass merchandisers, uh, Charlotte was ranked about uh, third, I think, of the cities we looked at. But for grocery stores, um, it was higher than any of the other cities we looked at. Uh, grocery store visits accounted for about 12% of total visits in Charlotte. Um, that's compared to, say, like 2% in New York City. So if you're looking at Charlotte, essentially there's a lot of business travel, uh, as we could tell from their airport travel. There are a lot of really ideal types of audiences for them in terms of millennials and young professionals, college students, grocery shoppers. Um, and then there's a lot of mass merchandiser and grocery traffic. And those were the three factors that we put together uh, when comparing all these cities. And Charlotte just popped out of it as the top. So besides retail and grocery, are there any other verticals that you think Amazon are planning to branch out to into the future? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> Amazon, it, it's so funny when we talk about analysis. I was talking to my team earlier today and I said, I was asking them something about the Amazon analysis and they looked at me and said, can you be specific? <laughs> like, <laughs> we're doing so, so much analysis around Amazon right now because they're really dominating 
um, the, the retail space. I think the one that I've heard that I find super interesting uh, is going into athletic wear. Uh, I just think it makes it makes so much sense for Amazon. There's been there's a big push, you know, a couple years ago into the um, athletic sort of trendy athletic gear um, in terms of, of those retailers coming out, and I feel like that that waned a little bit, and now people are really looking for the um, mass availability of, of that type of um, of that type of uh, gear, and uh, I, I feel like the that's the one that I've seen be the most interesting. <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk, obviously, about pharma and how that's going to change the space. And I don't know. I, I think that's been going back and forth with Amazon. Um, but there's going to be a lot of sort of shakeups in the, the pharmacy space, I think, in the next year as well. But um, Amazon just has a huge competitive advantage right now in terms of a footprint. And there's a lot of a lot of opportunities, I think, that are, are ripe for them right now. Can you also tell me about how Grand Truth predicted, and it's a big U.S. restaurant, uh, and how you predicted the earnings last year all through foot traffic data? I mean, you, you was on about a few moments ago, um, specific data, because I think this is a great example. Yeah, I think, and this goes back to, again, what I was saying, is location is the greatest source of intent. And you can see what people are doing in real time, looking at past behaviors to inform both uh, future consumer actions and also just um, informing what the, the market is going to look at. So um, I, I think foot traffic or, or um, foot traffic is a really great indicator of uh, future performance. Another example of how we're using this right now um, is so Black Friday is obviously a huge retail shopping day. There are some consumer trends we wanted to look at around Black Friday specifically this year in terms of how consumer behaviors are shifting. I know I've seen a ton of information coming on about online shopping is winning, foot traffic is losing, but I think there's still a lot of um, a lot of learnings you can get from looking at Black Friday and the in-store behavior. So for example, one of the things we're seeing is uh, what we're calling the just-in-time consumer. So online is a lot of the prepared shopping. You know, Some people have already done a lot of their online Christmas shopping for right now. People like me put it off until the day or two before <laughs> and go the day before, and you have to go into store for that. And it's interesting, going back to Amazon, actually, what we're talking about, what we call the Amazon effect, it's kind of the... Amazon almost um, created this type of con just-in-time consumer with their, uh, with them making people want things now, want things tailored to them, want things right away. So um, there's this mindset of people wanting this, but then this sort of human inclination <laughs> to wait until the, the last minute to, to buy things, which I think is actually, um, although foot traffic overall may be down from about five years ago, if you look at foot traffic the day or two before Christmas, it's, it's actually um, still going incredibly strong. So that's just an example of how you can use foot traffic to predict future behaviors. So we're taking a lot of what we're learning from how people are engaging both with Christmas time last year as well as Black Friday this year to predict what Christmas is going to look like this year from an in-store shopping experience. So what are the biggest trends that you've seen this year in 2017, in your opinion? And also, what trends do you think are going to go on and dominate next year in 2018? I think one of the biggest trends um, that, that we've seen, and this is, goes back again to the Amazon Whole Foods example, is really mergers and acquisitions. Uh, I think it's really defined 2017 and is going to continue to define the retail and just foot traffic and all spaces in 2018, um, it's really just making way for a consolidated shopping space. You're seeing, um, I, I think there's a big, I, I was mentioning pharma earlier, there's a lot of talk about uh, a big pharma mergers that's happening right now. You have Whole Foods and Amazon, but it's also leading the way for some sort of unusual, <laughs> unusual partnerships which is not only consolidating the space, but also driving innovation. Um, one of the ones that I think is one of, a little bit strange and a little bit uh, interesting is uh, Taco Bell and Forever 21 discount retailer. Uh, so we have a fast food restaurant and a discount clothing retailer partnering up to <laughs> put out a line of clothing, which at first makes no sense. <laughs> but if you think about who they're both going after in terms of the young, you know, sort of 22-year-olds, um, it, it's a great way to raise brand presence. So 
in addition to mergers and acquisitions, I think you just have these unusual partnerships and it's creating a, a huge change in the retail space. We, um, we actually looked at this in earlier this year, looking at fast casual restaurants versus fast food restaurants. And fast casual is usually a little bit higher quality ingredients, higher price point. Fast food is a little bit more accessible, um, quicker in and out experience in terms of the restaurant. But what's happening with those categories, for example, is uh, fast casual is lowering their price points and fast food is becoming a little bit more premium where there used to be this distinction. It's all blurring into one category. Um, and it's just it's changing the, the restaurant space for sure. And what about yourselves at Ground Truth? I mean, what will 2018 have in store for you guys? And, is, and also, is there anything else that you can share with us about what your focus will be next year? I think for, for 2018 for us, um, it's really, I would say a couple of things. One is continuing along the evolution of location. So, you know, lo- location in its early stages was just really proximity tar- targeting, where you're targeting around a business location. Then it evolved into targeting based on past behavior. So this is the audiences I was referencing before, where you can say, uh, this person has been to a sports stadium and a bar during a football game. So therefore, we're going to put them into a sports enthusiast bucket. So those were, you know, that was really early stages and sort of in the now. I think the future for location in general and for ground truth specifically really comes down to measurement. So, for example, we are offering a cost per visit model of measurement. If you think about advertising, really people used to be billed based on the impressions that they sent out or um, the views or the clicks. And what location's allowing us to do now is completely close that loop. And instead of billing based on whether somebody has seen an ad or minimally engaged with it, we're actually able to see whether somebody who served an ad then comes into a business location and closing the loop there uh, full circle with measurement. And then I think the next step after that is really predicting future behaviors. So um, basically for, for what we've been talking about, we can see what people have done in the past, predict futures, and then then close the loop and really uh, evaluate performance and plan based on on those predictions for the future. So if, if there is anyone listening that wants to find out more or ask you, maybe you guys a few questions about our conversation today, can you remind them of your website details and also contact details? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our website is just groundtruth.com, www.groundtruth.com. Uh, and personally, you can reach me, um, reach out to me directly, and it's Sarah, S A R A H, dot Oli, O H L E, at groundtruth.com. Fantastic. Well, a huge thank you for coming on the show today and really opening up my eyes, and I'm sure the listeners as well, on the insights that are available through location. And I love that line you used earlier that people may lie, but your location will not. It's a great line. So a big thank you for coming on today and uh, sharing your story. Great, and thank you for having me, Neil. Another fascinating topic for me today that revealed why location tech is such a critical aspect of marketing intelligence and the meaning of the insights are actually hidden in our location data. And as Sarah said in the show earlier there, people can lie, but location data cannot. Now, the prediction that this technology offered about behemoths such as Amazon is priceless on its own, but imagine what you could achieve or what you could understand by understanding your own customers more. As always, let me know your thoughts about today's show. Send me pics, questions or anything at all. I'm the easiest guy in the world to get in contact with. I'll reply to each and every one of your messages, unless it's just a sales pitch, of course. I like to think you'd like to get to know me before throwing a sales pitch in front of me. But hey, maybe I'm a bit old-fashioned that way. But keep all those messages coming over to techblogwriter at outlook.com and tweets at Neil C. Hughes. But I feel a nice warm glass of mulled wine coming on just to warm me up and calm me back down after a podcast recording. I'm sure you'll understand. But don't worry, I'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. And I've got another great guest lined up. But until next time, my friends, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.